Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? We are live and ready to worship with uh, all of you out there. We've got a few people here. Good morning. Good morning. Outstanding. So let's all find a spot where we are and stand up because we stand for God. We don't just kneel for him. We stand for him, especially when we're crying out to him and calling him. So let's call him into each one of our spaces with our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Sing to the Lord, sing praises. Tell them all God's wonderful words. Welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. So good to see you out there as we praise God this day. Our prayer focus this week is for the people of Brave Root, Lebanon. I don't know if you've seen any of the images, but it's such devastation with that explosion at that warehouse. In an instant, 300,000 people became homeless. Many more were injured and those that died. And it was just, you think about it. The pictures, there was a bride there getting her pictures taken as she was getting married that day, interrupted by the blast. There was a priest who was worshiping when the ceilings began coming down. And when we think that we have problems, I can only imagine what they are going through and how life can change in an instant. So keep them in your prayers 
as the world is responding to that crisis. And a big thank you to everyone who helped with the parking for the AAU track and field event that went on this last week. We took in around $8,600, which is gross. We don't have our expenses yet, but that was a wonderful fundraiser. It was crazy, it was hectic. And I want to really thank Rick Armstrong and Charles Huffman, because without those two, it wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have made that money. They were here every day, every morning, making things sure, right? They were doing the planning. So I really want to thank them. And this month, we are taking up an offering for UMCORD COVID-19 Sheltering and Love Program. They plan to release grants to equip partners who assist vulnerable communities, particularly racial, ethnic, and indigenous communities, and they will address feud and security needs and economic instability. So if you would like to give that, uh, just mark your donations COVID, and we will get it to the right place and get that to UMCOR where it will be distributed. And with that, then, let us continue praising God in song. Two quick things, if I may, here. One, we got some test results back on Bailey. Your prayers are amazing. Um, for the first time in over two years, she has been, uh, her disease is undetectable in her blood work. So praise God. So we've got part of it back, the rest will be back soon. But God just is amazing, the way he's been healing her and the way he's continuing to use her. And also, this is my, my Talison's last Sunday for a while. She's going back to college. So um, just a word of prayer for the teachers that are going back starting tomorrow and for all the college kids that are heading back to campuses that they'll one, stay safe, two, be smart about what they're doing and continue to um, just uh, don't forget to praise. Don't forget to praise. All right, well, let's join together in some more wonderful songs. Let's continue to uh, cry out to God to say, come to this place and be with us.
thank you for the desire, the desire that you placed on our hearts to seek you out. We thank you that you showed us the, the empty spot in our hearts that can be filled by none other than you. And Father, we come to you with a cry to show us, to show us where it is that we're supposed to go, who it is we're supposed to talk to. And Father, we thank you for the seeds that have been planted in each one of our hearts by somebody in our lives that would place a desire to seek you out even more. And you're awesome, Lord, and we thank you. We cry out. With that, thanks. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard. us every day to hear your call on our lives, 
to hear where you are sending us, to hear the promises you have given us, to hear your words of love and grace, to hear your words of courage. Lord, we thank you that you, you give us all these words. We thank you that you love us and that you fill us with hope and strength. And Lord, as we gather here this morning in many places, but with one heart to praise you, Lord, we lift up the people of Beirut. Lord, they were already enduring a pretty bad economic downturn. And now this has happened to them. And so, Lord, bless all those who are seeking to help. Bless your church, Lord, Lord in Beirut. Use those Christians there, Lord, to lift up. Use them, Lord, to bring comfort to those that are wondering what's next. And Lord, as a world, help us to come together to help. Lord, too often we're tearing down, but we're given these opportunities, Lord, to build up. And so, Lord, help us to use these opportunities to build up one another. Even those that we disagree with, Lord, help us to find the strength to lift one another up. And Lord, this day we also lift up all of our teachers, not only here in Brevard County, but throughout this nation. And many of our young people, some schools have already started, Lord, and some here in Brevard, they'll be going back in a couple weeks, and many universities have already started or will be starting this next week, Lord. And Lord, we ask for your protection for all those who go in to teach, all those students who go to learn. Lord, protect them from this virus. Help them to do what is smart. Help them to do what is right so that they can protect their fellow teachers, their fellow students. Lord, we know what to do, so help us to not be arrogant thinking we can ignore the rules. Strengthen all of those who are in our schools. And Lord, as we gather here, we also lift up those that are hurting this day. Those that need your healing, your strength, your peace. And so, Lord, we lift up all of those on our prayer list. You know their needs. We just know, Lord, you are the one that can touch them and heal them and restore them. So touch them, Lord. And, Lord, we also lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who showed us what true humility was, to live an active life grounded in you, grounded in your love. Lord, sometimes we get caught in all the voices around us. We get caught in looking at the things of the world and it brings fear into our lives. Lord, help us to focus on your love, your power, your hope for our lives and ignore all the voices that are calling us to go somewhere else, to look somewhere else. Lord, there are times that we are weak. There are times that we covet nice things and we just want good things to happen all the time and we know that's not always going to happen, Lord. So when those bad things come, help us to stay focused on your love so that there might be peace in our lives the peace that Christ brings. We thank you for that peace. And Lord, as a church here, help us continue to reach out in this community begun. Continue to show us how we can be your church, touching lives that you have called us to. And Lord, we now close this prayer in the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
beautiful moment to be with the Lord. We now come to that time where we would typically take up our offering, but we're not here to take it up. But I do thank you for all of those that are giving. We are kind of like we had our worst month of giving, I think, in June. It wasn't really great, but there are those who are faithfully giving, and for those, I praise God and I pray for you. Um, hopefully, we will get through this thing fine. Um, like I say, we, we think we got this year covered, but that doesn't mean you can't give because that will hurt us next year. But again, I thank you for all who are giving. We are working to do good in this community through your tithes and offerings. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we symbolically receive them. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your little hope. We thank you for everything you bless us with. And now, Lord, when we come and return just a portion of that blessing, you don't ask us to bring it all to you, even though all belongs to you. You just ask us to trust you. And Lord, so we come and present these sign, tithes and offerings as a sign of our trust with our whole lives. So Lord, bless them and multiply them. We pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. And amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning of the 22nd verse. Hear now these words. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart! It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, when one reads Scripture, one cannot help but see promise after promise after promise. A person once wondered how many promises were in the Bible, and they started to kind of research that, and he found re answers anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000 promises. Now, the 30,000 estimate might be a bit high, as there's only 31,000 verses in the Bible. But there's a person who did the research on this. In his book, All the Promises in the Bible by Herbert Lockyer, he tells of a man named Everett R. Storms. He's a Canadian school teacher for all you school teachers out there. And he decided to make a note of the promises during one of his readings of the Bible. See, he would every year or so, he would read through the Bible. And this was his 27th time of reading through the Bible. So he decided to journal all the promises. It took him a year and a half for Storms to compile his list. And he find out, found out that the promises in the Bible by God to man were 7,487. One man to another person were 991. God the Father to God the Son, there were two. And man to God, there were 290. And then there were other several combinations, including nine made by Satan. 
In all, Storm found, Storm's found 8,810 promises in the Bible. Promises when we read, we hear all the time. And yet we have to ask ourselves sometimes, do we believe them? Do we trust in them? Or are we like this couple that they, they pledge their love to one another, but we wonder. See, the, this photographer tells a story about this young man who came and he wanted a duplicate of his picture of his girlfriend. And while he was taking the picture, he turned it over and he noticed there was an inscription on the back. And it read, my dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more each day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. And it was signed, Diane. And then he noticed there's a little P.S. at the bottom, and it said, P.S., if we ever break up, I want this picture back. You wonder how much they hear the promises and would respond to them. And that's the question, how do we respond to the promises we hear? When we hear an answer to prayer, how do we respond? See, that question has an impact on our level of our faith. Someone once noted that faith is not an either you have it or you don't. It's more like where on the scale of faith, of no faith to total faith, are we? We see that in the man's answer to Christ when Christ asked him if he believed that he could heal his son. I love the man's answer. I believe, help my unbelief. He was crying out what all of us cry out at some point or another in our walk with God. I'm believing, but I, ain't on the, I need more to go. Philip Yancey said that faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And our gospel lesson is one of the more well-known stories in the Bible. One of which you've probably heard countless of sermons in your lifetime if you've been going to church at all. There's something in this story that captures our imagination. A human being walking on water, a human being doing the impossible. And it all began with Jesus completing another miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And it had been a long day for the disciples and for Jesus. He'd been teaching for many hours. And then at the end of the day, the disciples had told him to send everybody away. And he's like, no, I'm going to test you guys. I want you to feed this big group. And they're like, you're crazy. But he fed them with much left over. And after the feeding, we read that Jesus sent the disciples on across the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee, if I've been there, and you can kind of look across it. It's about four and a half miles wide and about seven miles long. So it wouldn't be that bad to walk around, halfway around the lake. You could do that in a day. So the disciples probably thought nothing of it. They went in the boat. They're going to go on away thinking Jesus will catch up to them the next day. And Jesus stayed and to behind to be with God. And we read that the disciples have gotten a good way across the shore, but now they've come upon a storm, which they will pop up every now and again in the lake, the sea there. And they're having trouble rowing against this storm. And in many Bibles, we read that it's the fourth watch. And Jesus is now cutting across the lake. He's going to take the short step, cut. Instead of going around, he's going to walk right across the water. And so it's the fourth watch, and he's doing this. And the fourth watch is between 3 and 6 in the morning. Have you ever woken up between 3 and 6 in the morning? That time that you're, there's just a lot on your mind, and you've got to wrestle with God, and you're trying to hear from God? Well, that's, in the Bible, there's significant events that happen in this 3 to 6 hour in the morning. Kind of a side note. Thinking last week, this is when Jacob wrestled with God before entering into his destiny as Israel. Moses led the Israelites across the Red Sea at this hour. The angel appeared to the shepherds in the field to announce the birth of Christ at this hour. And Jesus is resurrected from the dead at this hour. And here we find that Peter walks on the water. And when you look at these events... We see that one of the common elements is fear is in the human people there. 
When Moses was at the Red Sea, the people were feared. Why did you bring us out here? There's nowhere to go. We're going to die. When the angel appeared to the shepherds, they were fearful. That's indicated by the response to the angels that said, fear not. And when Jacob wrestled with God, he was surely afraid of what his brother was going to do because he knew he was coming at him with 400 men. And oftentimes in life, we allow that fear to control us. Someone once noted that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. See, doubt, I think, is actually part of our faith. It's when we doubt things and we struggle with them that we grow in our faith when we have those moments where we wrestle with God through those doubts. But fear is another thing. Fear is there is to destroy our faith. Fear does something else. Someone once said this about fear. Said it can limit us, defeat us, cause us to fail. It can literally paralyze our lives and call us to shrink back from achieving our goals. It is fear that keeps us unhappy and dissatisfied with ourselves. Unable to cope with the prospect of a meaningful change. It is fear that haunts our marriages, that causes us to stifle growth and fulfillment. It is fear that keeps many of us from succeeding in our work. Fear blinds us and blinds us to the possibilities and blinds us to the safe, sterile lives we've always lived. Fear produces sleepless nights as we worry about events over which we have no control. Fear does so much to us. And one of the things that I'm seeing as we live through this virus is many Christians are fearful. And we shouldn't be fearful. Now we need to be careful but not fearful. We should never fear death. We can say we don't want to die right now, which is fine. That's most of us, God says, I want you to live an abundant life, but we should never fear death. And we see this in other aspects. Think about your car. How many of you fear driving your car? In fact, over my years as a pastor, one of the things I've seen is when people get to the point in their age where they can't drive and their children are trying to take their car from them, they get very ornery because they do not want to give up their car. Yet, yet 39,000 people will die this year from driving a car and 4.4 million will be in an accident requiring them to go to the hospital with life-changing events. We don't fear driving, but we are careful about our driving. We train, we learn, and most of us are observant. There are those distracted drivers and drunk drivers, and we can't control them but we don't fear them. We live our lives knowing we can do what we can do. And Scripture over and over promises us good things. We must hear them and live on those promises. When Jesus called out to the disciples to not be afraid, to take courage because it was him, Peter made this bold request. I love it. Who would ever thought this is an answer? If it's you, Jesus, let me walk on the water. <laughs> It's like, how many of us would think of that as an answer to prove it is Jesus? Let me do the impossible. But when he made that bold request, Jesus simply said, well, come on. It's an answer to one's request. It's an answer to a prayer. And Peter acted on that response he heard. He got out of the boat and he started walking. See, when we act on God's promises... Great things happen, but when we act on God's promises, the world does not stop trying to mess with us, trying to call us to something different, trying to tear us down. We see this played out as Peter got in the boat. He began to go to Jesus with no problem, but then he stopped and he looked at the waves and listened to the winds and he became frightened. And see, the world at times can scare us out of our wits. There are times when we get news and we just are so devastated that it scares us. But God has said, if we keep with him, he will help us to overcome the world and to bless us. In fact, I think when we respond to God's calling, he will then call us somewhere else where he will bless us again. And when we respond to that, he will call us even further and bless us more. We get a picture of this in the Bible, and we see it through the life of Abraham. 
See, we got enough history of Abraham to see this blessing upon blessing upon blessing as Abraham answered and answered and answered. Notice that when God first called Abraham, it was simply, come and see the land. That's all God said. Come and see the land. And I will make you a great nation. We find this in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went. And as Abraham responded, he went, he got additional blessings. Later in Genesis 12, we find this. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared again to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. A new blessing. Now it's to your offspring. Not just I will show you the land. And then after this incident, an incident where his nephew Lot was captured along with his family and all his wealth, Abraham gathered a group of men and went out and captured Lot back, reclaimed him with his family and his goods. And Abraham then received another blessing. We find this in Genesis 14 where God says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. A new blessing. And then Abraham would ask God, well, how's all this stuff going to happen when I don't have a son yet? And a distant relative is going to inherit all I have. And so he receives another promise, another blessing. We find this in Genesis 15. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up to the heavens and count the stars. Indeed, if you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Another blessing, another promise. And it's recorded that Abram believed the Lord. And when Abram believed the Lord, we get a new thing. God laid him out to speak to him once more, to lay out his plan for Abraham in a ceremony that put Abraham into a deep sleep. And we find this in Genesis 15. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, but they, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at your good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not been reached its full measure. And when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. It's a wonderful picture of Abraham that is, as he believed and he went on that belief, he received blessing. And then as he believed again, he received another blessing. And we know it wasn't a straight line for Abraham. There were fits and starts. And we look at Peter's life. We see it wasn't a straight line. And I've often wondered if Peter had kept his eye on Jesus, had not worried about everything about him, what blessings he would have received if he had reached Christ. The two of them would have stood there probably and celebrated and laughed and forgot about everything around them. But he allowed the world to come in and take that from him. I found in my life that the more we trust in God and what God is telling us, the more peace and the more blessing we will have in our lives. I guess that's something when you get into your 60s and can finally look back, you see where God's been with you. And you see that not everything will go right. Or not everything goes the way we wanted it. But Christ was always there to reach out and to grab, grab me, grab us when we fail. And when we fail, we might hear a mild word of why didn't you believe? Because Jesus wants us to grow. But as we hear that word, we know that 
His love will never stop. This day is there's so much to fear, so much to worry about. Trust in God's word. Take things seriously, but do not be fearful. Hear God's promises for you that he will be with you always. As James says in his letter before Nike ever said, just do it. Just hear it. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you give us promise after promise and that you want us to live on those promises. You want us to be standing on those promises. You want us to know that they are a foundation to our life and that when the world wants to take us from those promises by filling us with so much stuff that we can't sleep at night, help us to focus on you, Lord, on your love, on your hope, on your grace. Lord, we need that. We need you. We need to feel your love. We thank you that it's always there. It's in your son's most precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. is enough and he gives us blessing upon blessing with promise upon promise and as we leave today reach up and grab God's hand because God is walking with you every day know that he is walking with you every day as we leave this place and as you go know that his promises are true that he will be with you through the storms of life and through the bright sunny days always with you, always caring about you, always loving you. So go in the security of God's grace. Amen. Amen. Amen.